I represent Riverside Urology. We've been doing uh, educational seminars that are related to health and in our situation urology now since 1990 and tonight we're going to focus on non-malignant um, prostate disease. To know yourself you have to understand a little bit about the anatomy. Here is the bladder, these are the kidneys, and this is the channel that carries urine to the outside. It's called the urethra. The prostate, which is really um, involved in this case in the urinary tract, but is in fact part of the reproductive system, uh, is centrally located to say the least. Uh, the population of this country is about 310 million and half of that are men. About 25 to 50 percent uh, will have prostate disease in one form or another but the most common form is benign prostatic enlargement and that's what we want to focus our attention on tonight. The men in the room realize that as we uh, get older, the volume of urine we put out when we urinate at any one time tends to diminish with age, and so does the velocity or the force of the stream. The prostate, it surrounds the channel that drains the bladder, and in so doing, has the capacity to influence the efficiency with which the bladder can empty. And if you want to think about this in a, in a example that isn't medical, think of a donut and think of the channel and a tube going right through that donut being the urethra. As that donut is bigger and the hole is smaller, the efficiency with which the fluid passes drops off uh, dramatically. So what is benign prostatic hypertrophy? Well, first off, it's the most common problem that men will have with their prostates. So what are the symptoms? A weak stream, having to go in a hurry. Now let me make this point. There's other things, for instance, stones in the urinary tract can create symptoms like these. Uh, the cancer in the prostate can create symptoms that are similar. A cancer in the bladder can create symptoms that are similar. Uh, maybe even a bad back or a nerve injury um, that relates to a fall or in older individuals maybe a vertebra that has collapsed and put pressure on the nerve. So we're not saying this is simple, but nevertheless the most common problem in men is the enlarged prostate. And the prostate as we know not only has just benign enlargement, but can have cancer and that brings up the subject of PSA, prostatic specific antigen. There's a lot of controversy about this, but it's one of the best tools we've got with certain types of PSA elevations. Uh, cancer is, is fairly predictable. What causes BPH? The testosterone has a lot to do with it. Benign enlargement of the prostate probably happens to every man, but I would say that somewhere in the vicinity of 35 to 50 percent of the men will become symptomatic and require some type of an intervention. So what are the symptoms? Well, uh, they usually center around a commode, knowing where it is and uh, getting there on time. These are the kinds of symptoms and you can review the slide and think about yourself. This is the AUA's voiding symptom score. But basically, you can take your symptoms and you can grade them and you can add the numbers together and the numbers will actually give you some guidance into what activity should follow. And these are areas that we're discussing, urgency, weak stream, straining, and getting up at night. And then you come to a score. As we go down the list, uh, we get into the high numbers. That means that you're probably going to have to take some action soon. If you don't, your life's not going to be very comfortable and you probably are going to put your kidneys at risk over time if you ignore those symptoms. If your symptom index is above 10, you're probably going to need something done. How do we treat it? Well, there's medication. Now, medication is probably the first 
line of defense. There's more than one type. There's the type that uh, relaxes the muscles of the prostate. So if you take a medication, for instance, uh, such as Flomax, what it does is it selectively relaxes the muscles in the prostate and allows the channel to be larger. There are other agents. Um, you probably have heard of uh, Proscar, which is now generically known as Finasteride, and Abadart, which is really Dutasteride. And what these agents are is they interfere with the metabolism of uh, testosterone, and they prevent high levels of testosterone from uh, being present and exposed to the prostate, and therefore the prostate tends to shrink. Let's talk about minimally invasive surgery. It's a popular term. The urology has been doing it since 1903. We've all probably in this room heard of transurethral resection. It's still a good procedure. The new technologies don't handle the big prostates nearly as well as the transurethral resection. So let's talk about contemporary technology. Uh, this is the green light laser. Now the laser can literally vaporize prostate tissue in a controlled fashion. This is what we call a KTP or green light laser and it vaporizes the prostate tissue that we aim it at. And it's tuned to the frequency of hemoglobin so it also seals the vessels at the same time so the bleeding is minimal. There's a distinct advantage to using this. Uh, you can do a fairly sizable prostate quickly, not much bleeding. It's a great new technology. This is another technology called transurethral needle ablation and this uses radio frequency. This too produces heat and the probe of, it doesn't get hot like the laser that boils and vaporizes, but it heats those tissues to the point it injures them. They swell a bit first and then they atrophy or shrink. So now you're using heat to essentially decrease the size of the prostate. Here you get a little better idea. You can see the probes, there's actually two of these, and it's probably, this punctures the lining, but it doesn't destroy it. It creates the heat below the level of the lining of the urethra. So there's very little irritation. When we create these lesions over time, this will just collapse. This area will have room to expand, and the resistance to flow will be significantly diminished. It's a situation which we can do in an office environment. We give our patients some Valium. Uh, we use a little oral Demerol. And then we use an ultrasound system to visualize the prostate and we numb the nerves to the prostate much like the dentist numbs the nerves to your tooth. It takes less than 40 minutes. The patient uh, uh, recovers in the context of, sits around the office in a comfortable chair where we can observe them for maybe 45 minutes, he goes home. It's a great, minimally invasive treatment strategy. This is pretty much what happens over time with recovery after transurethral needle ablation. There's few side effects. Uh, it has significant durability. We have patients now that are out almost 10 years. All the procedures we're talking about, for the most part, are done as outpatients. But long story short, BPH is very treatable.